Hello and welcome to Church to You, the online service of the Church of England in Mughal and Melling. My name is Reverend Janice Hill and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our time together today. And here we are in another lockdown. And I know for some people the thought of another lockdown is just really hard. But we're looking at lots of different ways that we can support you, that we can help you, that we can keep in touch. We've been in touch with all of our electoral role to ask them, can we keep in touch and how can we keep in touch, either by post or phone or by email. If we haven't been in touch with you because you're not on one of our electoral rolls for our churches, then please do get in touch through the Church to You email address. And I'm sure you all know what that is by now, but just in case. It's church to you at no, no, it's not. <laughs> Even I've forgotten it. It's church to you dot m and m at gmail dot com. So please do get in touch. If you've got any suggestions of how we can support you during this lockdown, then please let us know. We've got lots of ideas. So there's lots of things we're thinking about that we can do to support people in lockdown. But if you've got any ideas, please do get in touch. We've got the book club starting this Tuesday and we've also got the telephone service on Thursday at 11.30 plus Church to You will continue throughout. So please do take care. Please continue to pray. Pray for those who are ill. Pray for our National Health Service. Pray for the rolled out programme of the vaccines and give thanks to God for all the good things in our lives. I'm going to hand over now for the rest of our time together. You take care. Keep safe. God bless. Bye. Let us worship God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And the Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And so we begin with a time of prayer. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we say we're sorry to God for the things that we've done wrong this past week. Knowing that we do have a God who is there for us. A God who forgives us. And importantly, a God who loves us. So God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us for behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us for failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us and for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. And for living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. So may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And our special prayer for today, the first Sunday after Epiphany. Eternal Father, who at the baptism of Jesus revealed him to be your Son, anointing him with the Holy Spirit. Grant to us, who are born again by water and the Spirit, that we may be faithful to our calling as your adopted children. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading may be found in Acts, chapter 19, reading verses 1 to 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, 
Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptised? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptised with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from Mark 
chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I read a very interesting article in a magazine the other day that talked about the fragility of new ideas and inventions. The author wrote about how Alexander Fleming urgently needed to travel from his cottage in Suffolk to London, but before leaving, he found time to glance at a Petri dish and noticed that a colony of mould had started to dissolve the bacteria around it. Fleming could so easily have ignored what he saw because of his haste, and we would never have had penicillin. The article also discussed the institutional opposition that many inventors faced, including Kathleen Carrico of BioNTech, who, as a refugee from the Soviet invasion of Hungary and as a woman, has faced constant struggles to be taken seriously while becoming one of the key developers of mRNA vaccine. The author speculated on what other inventions might have transformed the world, but were lost because the inventor gave up the struggle in the face of powerful forces that were not able to accept anything radically different from what currently prevailed. John the Baptist was definitely someone who would have appreciated this article. He was unconventional. Let's face it, he was a very strange man who looked and acted oddly and who brought a challenging and unsettling message. The religious authorities of his time certainly agreed with him that the Messiah would appear and that he would overthrow earthly powers. The problem was that these authorities assumed the Messiah would justify them and overthrow their enemies. He certainly wouldn't oppose their authority and he was expected to appear as a great and powerful warrior king. There was no way that the Messiah would have been born in obscurity and there was no way that he would have been announced by a weirdo like John the Baptist with his interesting choice of clothing and diet. John the Baptist did not match the conventional expectation of the Messiah's herald and therefore faced opposition and eventual execution by those in power. Ordinary people, on the other hand, sensed that John was an authentic prophet, and so responded to his message wholeheartedly and with penitence. Jesus also failed the test of conventional expectation. He didn't resemble in any way the image of how the Messiah should look. Indeed, his humble acceptance of baptism at the hands of John would have confirmed the view that he was just another fake messiah, like so many who had appeared over the previous couple of hundred years. You and I can resemble the authorities from the time of John and Jesus, looking for familiarity and security, 
rather than adventure and risk. As we start a new year, and as we face many months of continuing uncertainty and vulnerability, it is all too easy for us to curl up into a protective ball and focus on preserving what we can, rather than looking for new and exciting opportunities. But as Christians, our focus should be on opening up God's kingdom, not hunkering down in ours. And so this year, we should be looking squarely at Jesus rather than at the virus. Now, I know this is relatively easy for me to say. As a retired and healthy person in his mid-60s, I don't have a job to lose and I have no obvious health issues. Nevertheless, what we collectively face now is no more than what Christians confront in many parts of the world all the time, where extreme poverty and persecution are everyday realities. And yet, the Christian faith seems to be flourishing where the ground looks so spiritually barren. Why do starving people worship a God who promises milk and honey, and yet appears to be ignoring his own? Why do persecuted people worship a God who could so easily wipe out the persecutors and set his people free, but who doesn't? We have to be careful not to look just for the God of Magal and Melling, but instead look for the God of planet Earth. Despite Western history books showing the growth of the church under the patronage of powerful popes and Christian kings, much of Christian history is rooted in areas of struggle against the environment and the prevailing authorities. And so we too can raise our eyes from our immediate circumstances and try to see where God is at work and seek to do what we can to assist him. Now, I would not be so arrogant as to dictate to you what I think God is specifically specifically doing in your life and in your community. And I would certainly not be so presumptuous as to prescribe how you should engage with God's work. However, I do long for us to raise our eyes from the monster in front of us and look to the sovereign God of all creation. In saying this, I recognise with humility those of you who are ahead of the game here. Those who have knitted shawls, hats and gloves for people on the streets. Those who have made cards and candles for neighbours. Those who have visited where possible and regularly telephoned where not. Those who have shopped, prayed and generally overcome all of the constraints to serve our community, both near and further afield. Please God you will continue to serve in this way. But, as I said earlier, I would plead with all of us to look beyond the God of Magal, Melling and Merseyside and to the God of planet Earth. This year I urge you and me to think about how suffering Christians through history and in the world today have not only survived, but have grown in faith and built God's kingdom on stony and unyielding ground. I urge us to pray, to seek God's will, to earnestly desire God's prompting and power, to offer ourselves, yes, even in our vulnerability, as God's willing disciples. The virus will attack us. The increasingly atheist culture in our country will oppose and may eventually persecute us. But we are here for the sake of Jesus Christ, not for our own flourishing. If we can offer our meagre five loaves and two fishes in the service of God, then this time of immense challenge and threat may become an era in which our nation is fed with the gospel and becomes replete with a life-giving and never-ending Christmas feast. Amen. Let us pray. 
merciful God. The psalmist told us that light dawns for the righteous and the compassionate. We ask that you hear our prayers with compassion. We lay our petitions before you at a time when the coronavirus seems to be having a more devastating impact upon people's lives in this country and overseas than at any time before. Yet we know in darkness that the light is dawning. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, those who live in fear of the virus, for those whose employment, family relationships and home life have been turned upside down and their way of life has been curtailed. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for wisdom at this time, for those in central and local government in this country and overseas. We pray that democracy will be safeguarded and enable people to feel they have a stake in society. Yet we're mindful of those who feel disenfranchised and disempowered across the globe. May all people be treated as being in your image, O God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We continue to give you thanks that in this country we can hear your word, read your word, freely talk about your word without fear or hindrance. Protect others from those who would weaponise your word and misuse it as a form of oppression with which to exclude others and sow division. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. In our benefice in the Diocese of Liverpool, we pray for our four churches of St Andrew, St James, St Peter and St Thomas. May we find new and innovative ways to include people in giving you worship and praise and in reaching out and loving our neighbour. Compassionate God, help us to move forward to that time when the dawn shall break and the day spring from on high shall fall upon us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Thank you for joining us in our act of worship today on this the first Sunday after Epiphany from the Magal of Mellington Ministry. May this week be a blessing to each one of you. Stay safe and take care. And so our final prayer for today is the Epiphany Blessing. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Be amongst each one of you and those who you love this day and always. Amen. <laughs>